Other fillers that can be used um, to modify the properties of a polymer include specialty fillers such as um, PTFE, carbon fiber, stainless you know, steel fiber. Um, these different types of fillers basically can give electrical or thermal connectivity, can um, provide um, wear and friction inhibitors, and also dampening control for, for noise and, and sound issues. Uh, when choosing a material for, for selection, it's, it's not only a good idea to look at the general characteristics of that material, as well as the additives that are being utilized, but it's also important that that you look at the the, pro the properties. Um, different polymers are very different from metals in that they have both short and long-term properties, and it's important to understand um, each each of those. I'm going to quick go through a couple important points. Um, on these properties that are that are critical for material selection. Um, just a quick look here at some some general or, or you know some, just name a few short-term properties of polymers include density, tensile properties, impact strength, thermal behavior, electrical behavior. Um, but more, what's more important is to really understand um, how polymers react um, short-term and how they behave short-term. <clears throat> so a quick look here. Basically, we'll give you uh, an overview of um, an example of the temperature and humidity effect on a nylon 6.6 uh, glass-filled resin. Now, this now nylon, nylon 6.6 resins, um, nylons in general, are known to be hygroscopic materials, which means they're going to absorb water. So, so both uh, humidity is going to have an effect on it as well as temperature. Um, so you can see here, if you look at the dry as molded, you can or even equilibrated at 50% relative humidity. You can see that at lower temperature, you're getting a decrease in elongation, an increase in modulus, and an increase in strength, which gives the part basically an overall increase in stiffness. Um, at elevated temperature, you can see uh, an increase in elongation, a decrease in modulus, and a decrease in strength, which gives the part an overall increase in ductility. The effect of humidity um, on the part or material is going to be most significant at room temperature. The, the effect at elevated temperature on humidity um, is not as high as at room temperature because as you increase the temperature, you um, also start to drive water out of the material at the same time that water is trying to come into the material. Um, overall, um, these effects are dependent on polymer content. So um, the effect of temperature increases and humidity increases um, are going to increase. Um, when you have more polymer, so basically adding you know, reinforcement or filler will somehow you know decrease those effects somewhat um, on the material. So it's also important, you know, from this slide to take away that when you're designing parts and you're when you're comparing materials, if you're comparing material that that absorbs water readily versus one that does not, it's important that you really compare that the condition properties of of the material. Um, especially for nylon. So if you're comparing a nylon to a propylene material, it's important that you compare the condition properties of the nylon so you get a good apples to apples comparison because more than likely um, the material is not going to be uh, dry as molded in the application the entire time. Um, it's probably going to cycle through a dry condition and maybe you know in the winter dry and then in the summer it's going to be um, have more water absorbed in it. It's, it's kind of going to flux between those two conditions. A look at the uh, the orientation effect on using uh, fiber filled materials that I talked about earlier with the anisotropy. Basically, most of the properties that are provided today in data sheets and and what everybody tests is um, a material that's been molded in the flow direction. So really, uh, the properties that you're seeing are really the optimal properties that you can get from that material. Um, it's it's unlikely that in the part you would you would have purely flow direction properties, it's more likely that you have a combination of both the flow and cross flow direction. You can see that there's a great a great deal of difference between the properties in the flow direction, which you know basically aligns the polymer chains and the fibers in that direction of tensile um, as a com opposed to the flow direction, which everything is lying uh, perpendicular to that direction. Another another important thing to discuss quickly is um, the impact strength of a of a material. I just wanted to quick um, go through um, this because it's very difficult to look at a data sheet and see some impact values 
and, and make judgments on those and understand how it's going to work um, in your part. So the definition of in, impact strength is the ability of a material to withstand a sudden load. And this varies greatly with specimen thickness, um, impact speed, and temperature. Um, two types of, of those types of tests are notched IZOD and Sharpie, which are pendulum type tests or a multi-axial test. Um, IZOD is, a, is an okay test, but it's not, it, it can have some variation due to um, basically the thickness of the sample can, according to the, the ASTM standard, can vary anywhere from 3 millimeters to 12.7 millimeters. Um, and as a result, you're going to, you're going to get different, uh, impact strengths as a result of those thicknesses, um, even though it's normalized for thickness, it's still going to have an effect on, on the data. Um, so this is important because likely y your your part wall doesn't meet, uh, isn't si similar to what these values are, these 3 to the 12.7 millimeters. And also if you're comparing, each material kind of has an optimal thickness where they're going to get the best impact strength value. So if you're comparing um, against different types of materials, you're, you're not going to be using the same thickness, which is going to kind of skew the results as well. Um, so in general, notched IZOD and Sharpie are, are, are okay indicators of, of tough, toughness, but they really um, aren't accurate for comparing resin types. Um, they're only good between different grades of the same resin. Um, and also another thing to note is that um, both acetal and nylon, which are very tough materials, um, actually will show very poor um, results in this test because they're very not sensitive. Um, Multi-axial impact test is a, is, a, is, a, is a somewhat better test to do. Um, you actually get force versus deformation due to impact. Um, you can actually get energy to crack formation and propagation, which can correlate to parameters such as fracture toughness and fracture resistance. Um, but all these impact tests, it's very difficult to translate to design parameters. Um, it lacks portability to the you know, part geometries. And it's also difficult to correlate results with service performance. An example of you know how impact strength data can be misleading um, is shown in this next slide. On this slide, you would you would look and you'd say, okay, what's you know just looking at the notched IZOD data, what material has the best the best impact you know resistance? And looking just at the notched IZOD, you would see that oh look, the tough and top, uh, PVC you know has an impact strength of 12 you know 0 0.07, so that's obviously the best. So going to a multi-axial um, instrument and impact test, you can actually see that the energy to peak, peak load, which is actually the resistance of the material to crack formation, um, the highest is with polycarbonate. So actually, according to this test, polycarbonate is going to give you much better uh, impact resistance. Um, and the post-peak energy is very high for tough and PVC. However, this is just the energy to resist crack extension, not to resist the crack formation. And the key would be um, preventing the crack formation because once you get a crack, it's, it's only a matter of time before it, it actually extends. Uh, just a quick couple notes on uh, long-term polymer properties, which um, include creep, stress relaxation, fatigue, um, heat aging, uh, UV stability, and also water absorption. I'm just looking at a couple of them to show how how those uh, affect the polymers. Is uh, the first one would be creep, and creep is defined as an increase in strain uh, with time under constant load. So you can see here that um, the the effect of creep increases with temperature. It also increases with load, and it decreases with glass content. So these are these are important things to uh, think about when, de when designing or, or selecting your material. Um, if you start having problems with creep, adding some, you know, uh, glass filler in there would potentially help help you with those issues. And the next next graph is a quick look at the effect of heat exposure um, on a material as well. And this basically gives you um, on the bottom it shows you temperature versus half life. Um, and basically, half life is defined as the time it takes to reach half of the original property. And the original properties are defined on the bottom. The solid line is dielectric strength, and the dotted line is tensile strength um, properties. And these values were obtained at uh, 1 16th inch thickness. So you can see as you move from the lower temperature um, on the right-hand side of the graph to the higher temperature on the left-hand side, you can see how quickly um, these properties start to decrease um, in this resin. So it's very important to understand that if you're seeing 
you know, 100 degrees C for, you know, for 4,000 hours or 5,000 hours that you understand and, and design into the, the part and, and the material, um, how your properties are going to be affected and that you take those into consideration. Some additional um, property influences um, it includes uh, molecular weight. Uh, mechanical uh, properties and chemical resistance um, of a material are, are both known to increase in general when, when you increase the molecular weight of the resin. The downfall is that when you do this, um, viscosity also increases, and with that comes increased processing costs. So in general, an optimal molecular weight is a balance between um, you know, these two, viscosity and, and mechanical properties. Um, Melt flow rate is a general measure or an indication of molecular weight. Um, so when you increase um, melt flow rate, you're actually decreasing the molecular weight of the resin. And when you decrease the melt flow rate of the material, you're increasing the molecular weight. So for example, if you had a polycarbonate resin that you were trying to use in an application and you're seeing some, some you know, me mediocre results, uh, potentially increasing the melt, or melt flow rate of the resin would give you some improved properties and maybe get you um, to be successful in that resin. You got to make sure at the same time though you're not seeing increased issues with scrap um, uh, or or other processing issues that might result from having an increased molecular weight. Some selection considerations for um, materials. Uh, we'll go through those quickly and then move on to the case studies. Um, general information including what's the function of the part, what's the geometry, what's the design constraints, um, how long is it required to be in service, what are the consequences of part failure, is it a high risk, um, like is it, is, a, is it a biomedical application, for example. <laughs> Assembly method, um, how are you going to assemble this part in, in the application? Are you going to fasten it with screws? Are you going to weld it together? Um, or you're going to use adhesive methods. So understanding how those are going to interact with your material um, are very important. If you're using a glass filled nylon material, self, you know, using the mechanical fastening method might result in some fracture due to it's not, not sensitivity. And welding, making sure you're welding materials, uh, similar materials together, uh, not dissimilar. And adhesive methods, understanding what chemical effects um, using adhesive might have um, to the material that's in contact with or in its general vicinity. Um, of course, mechanical requirements, you know, what kind of stress is, is it going to see, um, what, what's the maximum deformation that can take place, um, effects of friction and wear, also chemical resistance. Um, understanding both chemical resistance um, or chemical exposure while in service, so primary chemical exposure, but also understanding secondary, and secondary could be um, the result of uh, something else going on in the application, um, or it could be um, something that's applied during uh, secondary processes um, or assembly. Um, oftentimes, you'll see in assembly, you know, especially with stuff that needs to be very aesthetic, they'll clean parts off, making sure they're using a cleaner um, that's that's compatible with the material is very important. Um, I just know on the bottom that chemical attack um, is over 30% of all failures, so it's a significant. Uh, contribution to poor material selection is not fully understanding um, the chemical exposure. And it's not so much the primary, although that is a problem, but more, more often than not, you, you see the failure with the secondary exposure. Uh, electrical properties, voltage requirements, insulation requirements, uh, operating environment, sunlight, weathering, humidity, temperature, all these things are very important. And actually, temperature, um, both, you know, Maximum continuous, short-term elevated, and minimum. Those are those are usually the number one driver of re resin cost. Um, second, I would say, is probably the, the chemical resistance portion of it. Uh, appearance. Um, what co you know does it need to be colored? Understanding uh, what colorant to use and making sure you're using it, one that's compatible in the material. Um, surface finish. Um, poly plastics are often. Um, only able to meet certain uh, finish requirements. So a class A finish would definitely narrow down you know, your list of, of um, possible candidates. Does the material need to meet certain codes or specifications?